and a hush falls over the room. Oh, as our last panelist arrives, that's great. So perfect timing. Okay, so just to recap, a couple highlights from the day so far. Uh, from Jeff Guerin, PowerPoints will save the world. Um, Dave Winston, if the, if the roof is on fire, don't worry about the window treatments. Um, everybody in the last panel agreed that NCLB is outdated. And remember when 2014 seemed like a long time off? And uh, I think it was David in the last panel. Um, chlorine is the best disinfectant against bad research. So I, th I think we've, uh, we've learned a lot today already. Um, so much of the discussion today so far has brought to mind what's really getting to be something of a classic expression, and that's it's the economy, stupid. Um, Economic concerns clearly loom large in the national psyche, and it, it's not to say that this is all in our heads. These are really um, important issues in a lot of people's lives. Uh, public reaction to the recession, frustrations, anxiety over the slow recovery um, were the driving factor, or at least uh, one of the very important ones behind the dramatic swings we saw in the midterm elections last week. And within education, the federal stimulus programs have aimed to shore up decimated state budgets at the same time that they're trying to catalyze a very ambitious agenda for innovation and school improvement. It's probably safe to say that there have been more questions than answers here, um, and there's more questions coming. Was the stimulus effective in saving education jobs? Did the influx of federal dollars actually spur real reform and structural changes as it was intended? Or did states and districts forestall tough decisions that they'll have to make now or soon. Um, and what happens when the money runs out? That's a question a lot of us have been asking. Now that the bulk of the federal stimulus money has been committed, what's next? Will states and school districts tumble down a funding cliff, this funding cliff we keep on hearing about, um, and during that fall erase all the momentum that we've gained over the past couple of years? Or can stimulus area reforms somehow be sustained as states claw their way back um, from a national recession? Um, if anyone can answer those questions, I think it's our next panel. Um, so, so the bar is set very high here. Um, you're about to hear from some of the nation's most respected school system leaders, uh, policy experts, and school finance analysts. They can speak to these issues all the way from the 30,000-foot level down to the ground and grassroots and everywhere in between. So we're very lucky to have uh, this panel with us today. Uh, to lead the discussion, uh, we'll be joined by Michelle McNeil. Uh, Michelle McNeil, as many of you probably know, is an assistant editor at Education Week. Uh, she covers issues near and dear to our hearts, U.S. Department of Education, federal education policy, and school finance. Uh, she's also the other half of the dynamic duo I alluded to before, uh, along with Allison Klein, who writes our Politics K-12 blog. Um, and in fact, uh, Michelle launched that blog way, way back in 2007, right, um, during the run-up to the last general election. Uh, and it, at that time, for, you know, fans in the room, it used to be called Campaign K-12. Uh, so let me turn things over now to Michelle, and she'll introduce the panelists. Thank you, Chris. We've got four esteemed panelists and not a lot of time, so let's get started. I want to do very quick introductions. First, we have Andres Salonzo. How did I do on the first name? You did uh, well. <laughs> he's the um, CEO of Baltimore City Schools. Next to him, we have Karen Holly Miles, who is the Executive Director of Education Resource Strategies. Then we've got Cindy Brown who is the, let's see, got to get your title right, Vice President for Education Policy at the Center for American Progress. And then there at the end, we have William Height, who is the Superintendent of Prince George's County Public Schools. So welcome. So the gist of our panel is we had a lot of money come in from the stimulus. The ride is over. And so now what? And so that's what we're going to talk about here today. So the first question I wanted to pose, just to kind of get the conversation started, is there were two goals with the stimulus, right, to help uh, school districts avoid really draconian cuts and to spur reform. So now that the money's running out, did we, I think we all know that the money did help um, with budgets, but did we see real reform? And we've got some um, people who can talk about it up here and also down at the um, uh, grassroots level. So, Andres, let's start with you. Did the stimulus lead to reform in Baltimore City, and if so, exactly where? Well, I think the reform in Baltimore City started before the stimulus, and uh, the, uh, the stimulus and, and the goals in the stimulus uh, very much coincided with what we were already trying to do. Uh, there, were, there was, I think, a, a, a confusion in the goals, as in uh, uh, it's very hard to do radical reform and safeguard what is there at the same time. Uh, 
for us, before two years before the stimulus, we had already cut the central office by uh, 33 percent. We had uh, reoperationalized uh, the district in terms of, of how we send money to schools. Uh, Karen was a, was a partner in the work, so she can speak about it more. Uh, so uh, I think the answer is yes, yes and no, yes and yes, as in uh, uh, there, was, there was a lot of work and, in, independently of what we were doing, especially at the state level, which was very much about falling into line with, with the new direction. Uh, uh, at the same time, the, the funding from the stimulus for most of us uh, was, a, uh, uh, was very much about avoiding uh, uh, radical cuts at a place in time. Uh, because the state, which over the past decade had significantly improved funding for education, uh, was beginning to roll back that investment. Uh, the question for many of us, or some of us who were arriving at the end of the investment, was what had happened and where, where was the return on the investment in terms of, of the kinds of programs, uh, the kind of strategic uh, elements of the work that you know I found missing. So when I arrived, the work was 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 pre in pre stimulus was very much about what became uh, uh, the basis of the stimulus in in terms of its policy direction. In Prince George's County, um, is that kind of in line with what you what Baltimore City experienced? Pretty much so. And when you think about this, the fact that at the time we were in a free fall with respect to revenue. And I, I share with many of my uh, constituents and elected officials that we've eliminated 1,800 FTEs and have cut $300 million out of our budget. And this year looks like another year where we're going to be making recommendations to cut in excess of $100 million out of our budget for a fourth year. And so we've just like all other systems across the country, we've dealt with furloughs and reductions and reclassifications. And so the stimulus actually allowed us to s slow the bleeding some. It, it wasn't as much a catalyst for reform as some other things had, that had transpired, as Andreas indicated in Baltimore. In Prince George's County, we had already started really reforming our evaluation system. Uh, reforming how we, um, how we um, funded schools. We changed mechanisms for determining effectiveness for teachers. So we had begun that work before, but we were just trying to hang on. And I do think there was some confusion with the notion of um, job creation versus just trying to maintain what was there. And the other dynamic that we were working in, at least in Maryland, uh, with respect to stimulus, a large amount of that money was used to backfill funding that we had previously received from the state. So it wasn't, it wasn't new money. It was money that was essentially replacing uh, a shortfall at the state level, and it was just passed down through, through the districts. Karen, you've worked with a lot of districts. So can you talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of whether the stimulus was a catalyst for reform or whether it really did just slow the bleeding and keep people hanging on? Um, so what I would say is that these two just we do deep work with urban school districts around the country to really understand their spending and to think about how to align it with um, strategies that will improve performance. And so these two districts are out in front. So the stimulus funding came um, when they had already identified a vision for the things they needed to do to transform their schools and their systems to, for the 21st century. So they were already investing in things like teacher evaluation systems, thinking about revising compensation, thinking differently about the models of schooling, how time is used, how people are used in schools, and what the role of central office is. Um, in comes the stimulus funding. In that context, it lets them say, OK, so I can have a little breathing room here. I can continue to protect some of those investments, in fact, beef them up. In Baltimore City, they spent money on um, you know, pre-K and refitting some of their schools in order to do some of those things to protect those investments while still not having to, you know, to cut everything else. I would say that a lot of the urban districts that 
we know about or not in that position. So they use those funds to, to kind of hold the line a little bit um, and to start thinking about what they needed to do. And what I, what I want to say is, so those districts, and I think it's really important in this room that we get out in a message is, those districts are going to face in next year and the following year a huge crunch. So we did a survey across the Council of Great City Schools and those folks are predicting a four to eight percent budget gap um, next year and getting worse the previous year. And what people don't understand is that the existing cost structures in school districts, they go up automatically every single year no matter if they don't do anything differently. So in the context of budget cuts, because salaries go up, benefits go up every single year regardless of any kind of productivity increase, and then, um, and then um, the, the class sizes and staff are held constant. So in, in many in the contracts and things like that. So in order to get out of this, this is the moment, right? So we can either cut, 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 make all these cuts, or we can start with a vision of something that is very different, um, that's around uh, building effective teachers, restructuring all those things around that, making better use of time and all of that, and use this moment. So the stimulus let us have a little breathing room in combination with the, um, with the race to the top where we got really clear guidance and investment around the most important transformational areas. We now have this huge sense of urgency that we've got to make it better combined with this budget crunch that will be unprecedented. We will, we will, we've not seen something like this in the last couple of decades around um, education spending. And so the question before us, I think as a nation, is are we going to use this moment to sort of wipe the slate clean and really start differently about how we want to think about what schools and district systems look like and those cost structures that make it so hard to use money innovatively? Are we going to use that moment or are we going to just trim at the edges again and just keep doing less with less? And I want to get back to that, but first, Cindy, are you seeing, I'm not hearing a lot of reform, and I think right. that that's, I mean, I think we all probably knew that. Um, where you sit, are you seeing it? Are we missing anything? Oh, sure. And, and see that, uh, I think the stimulus had a huge effect on reform because of the assurances that were required in the distribution of the money to the states, who then in turn distributed it to, to districts. So we've never had the kind of power. I, I've been in Washington, working in Washington over 40 years. So um, might be the oldest person on this speaking today. Uh, so I've seen it all in Washington, D.C., and I have never seen the kind, and I worked 15 years with states when I was at the Council of Chief State School Officers. I have never seen the kinds of changes at the state level with state policy that we have seen in the past year. So, and that is about reform. It's, it's states are setting a framework for reform. Whether they'll, I absolutely agree with Karen, whether they're going to carry forward with wise decisions um, yeah. below the state level, at least you're getting better frameworks. I mean, saying you have to have high standards and high quality aligned assessments, saying that you have to increase teacher effectiveness and equitably distribute teachers um, and connect student and teacher data. You know, before the stimulus, there were just a handful of states that could do that. Now everybody either is doing it or is about to do it. I mean, that's a huge change, fast. Um, that you have to develop and use longitudinal data systems um, and connect from pre-K through college. Again, that wasn't happening. And they're not all in place yet, but they're, they've made these states, in order to get the stimulus money, made a commitment to do it. And then this, this focus that you heard some about in the last panel of, of providing targeted assistance to the lowest performing schools. Again, states had to make a commitment to do that. A lot of questions about their capacity to do it, whether they know what to do, but at least they made a commitment to do it in a way they never had before, and that was an exchange for the money. Yeah. So I think it did have, it, it, it may have had a better, there are those who argue that the stimulus just put off these tough decisions mm -hmm. that um, the three of them have been talking about, but it clearly moved forward a reform framework for going forward yeah. in, in yeah. public education. And it sounds like now then the really hard work, not that states don't have a lot of hard work because uh, state budgets are, you know, a mess. disastrous a mess right now, <laughs> 
but it sounds like a lot of the hard work needs to happen at the district level. Karen, is that kind of what I'm hearing from you, that this fundamental change in cost structure needs to happen at the district yeah. level? Although I would say that it's a combination, because a lot of the things that are embedded in the cost structures are a function of state uh, legislative context. So for example, in many states, the state still sets the teacher salary schedule. They are the ones that the control pension. the pensions. Yep. Uh, there are class there are states that have the class size mandates right. um, that make it difficult. So it's a it's a it's a really a complex set of things that are going to have to be uh, addressed both at the state and the local level. So from our superintendents, what are you eyeing as far as fundamental cost structural changes that you can do going forward given these tough budget constraints. Well, can, I, can I add to what was said before that the problem that I see is that you have a rhetoric of reform and change superimposed on an operational frame which is essentially conservative. As in any change comes at a huge cost and we see it in play in Maryland right now with the race to the top changes to the race to the top uh, regulations which is that a, a frame changes uh, with, with a lot of political back and forth in a, in a year where, where there's an election. And then after the election is over, then there is a, there's tremendous ambiguity now about what happens around the question of teacher evaluations, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you have a kind of, of huge gravitational pull towards uh, 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 not disrupting what is there. Yeah. Uh, uh, which, which might have its merits, but uh, there, is, there is this real tension between the thrust for reform and uh, the pieces that, that are already there. The second element of it is that the, the local context matters tremendously, both at the state level and at the local level. And the conversation is taking place at the end of a decade of huge expansion. And I was saying before, I was deputy chancellor in New York City. When I arrived in New York in 2003, the budget was $11 billion. I read yesterday in the New York Times that the budget last year was $23 billion. New York, of course, is crying about having to cut back on the budget. But that's, that's quite a remarkable increase in the budget. <laughs> the, 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 and part of the question should be, what happened and what was the money spent on? Mm -hmm. okay? In Maryland, and, and again, it's all about the facts, the, the state investment in education in Maryland changed by 78 percent between 2002 and 2008. The local investment changed by 34 percent, zero in Baltimore City because we're quite unique in terms of the local investment, but 34 percent in terms of the counties. The federal investment increased by 30 percent. So now we hit the moment where it's, it's the cliff. And the cliff for us has been defined as it didn't continue to expand. Mm -hmm. As in, what happened in 2008 is that the state basically closed the spigot, and then when it threatened to reduce, the stimulus came in to plug it in. And the conversation that's not taking place is, you know, where is the evidence? And, and we, we have plenty of evidence in terms of outcomes that good things happen. But in terms of operations and the linkage between what happened in terms of operations and the outcomes, there hasn't been enough thought about the means conversation that was referred to earlier. The means matter, as in, for me to expand pre-K, which is not included in the Thornton formula, the funding formula in uh, Maryland, I have to take money from my K-12 to funding. Now, I've expanded pre-K by 1,800 seats in the last three years while cutting roughly $50 million a year from the budget every year because I think it matters. And those kinds of conversations are not taking place in a context of in order for us to continue to do certain things, something has to drop. Something has to drop. The other piece, and I'll shut up because I'm taking too much time. The, the pension conversation is brutal. Yeah. Brutal. The state has a $1.6 billion infrastructural uh, shortfall. There's a that would, it spends $900 million a year in pensions. It's beginning to focus on the locals as the reason for this, even though while passing the laws 10 years ago that allow for the expansion, they said you have to hire more teachers in order to reduce class size, and you have to pay them more because we have shortages. 
Now, however, the locals are at fault. What the state is not discussing is how it changed the rules for pensions four years ago during a flash economy in an election year in ways that basically are bankrupting us from now until they change the rules again. So that local political conversation is brutal. We are in some way buffer because three years ago we did a lot of hard things that shifted how we do, do operations. And because we have also built a political constituency that some level ensures that we won't be touched. But all the districts in the state, I think, are in a different position. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. In Prince George's County, are there any fundamental cost structure um, changes you're eyeing? Yeah, actually, we're, we're, eyeing, we're eyeing everything. everything. And Everything's on the so table. So when yeah. we talk about stimulus, and I would say the greatest catalyst to reform or to restructuring how we, um, how we finance and, and fund ourselves has been the economy and looking at how we will have to use resources differently moving forward. Because what I, I don't have the luxury that Andreas has in, in Baltimore City where they are held harmless and they got all this other money that um, he doesn't more, give to anyone else. You've got more money than I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't have that luxury. So, so part, of, part of this is really, and this is, uh, we've been working with Karen as well because of the tremendous work she's done in Baltimore and other places. But um, Karen shared something almost a year ago, and it, it um, resonated with me. And the point was, so if we wanted to reduce all classes to 15, transport students, um, provide everything we need, incentivize teachers, and pay them $100,000, we have the money in place to do that right now. We have the money in place if we started over. But inside of the structures that Andreas just described, what we're finding is this, this push-pull on reform versus these, these structures that have been in place that won't allow us to just kind of revamp some of the things that, that we feel should be changed. So I'll give you, um, I, I give you a, a primary example. We, we want to change our compensation system, and we want to incentivize. We have a bimodal um, distribution of teachers right now. We have a lot of teachers at one to five and a lot who are eligible to retire. But we don't have many in between. And so we're trying to create a mechanism that incentivizes those teachers at the five-year mark to really remain in their system. And just the attempt to do that, both locally, statewide, and statewide, has, it just runs up against but wait a second, we have this model that incentivizes me because I have a degree, I have this certification or that certification, and my years of experience, and fundamentally, we're not ready to have the conversation about is that the most, uh, or is that the most practical way to ensure that an effective teacher is in every classroom. So it's just not, um, it's just not a, a stimulus conversation because that money has come and it's about to go. Yeah. Um, and we still have to do this work. I think more, it, it's more akin to what will happen because of the uh, race to the top and the things that the state, those assurances that the state must now provide to, in, order to, um, in order to receive the money. We tried to close a school three years ago. And we ran up against just opposition. We ended up closing it anyway because, you know, 6% of the kids there were proficient in math. Now, this past year, because of um, some of the turnaround money that was a function of stimulus, so we closed four. And we were able to do that. And so that type of, that type of, um, of activity has been a direct result of this. But I, I think the bigger issue is how do we restructure what is already in place? Yeah. And how do we do that to incentivize and to fund those things that we think of, quote unquote, as reform? And in the past, we've only been, we in Prince George's County have only been able to do that when there were dollars um, available. The Teacher Incentive Fund grant, the Small Learning Communities grant, now Race to the Top, um, and other mechanisms that have allowed us. But we have to 
really start having an honest conversation about the resources that we have in place right now. The, yeah. the other thing is that if you look across the country, and Karen is the great expert on this, you have districts that are paying that where the per pupil is $23,000 per child, right? And they're phenomenally unsuccessful districts. I taught in one of them. <laughs> and, then, and then you have, you know which one I'm referring to. And then, and then you, have, you, know, you have districts that are, that where the per pupil is six, seven thousand dollars right. per child. So, you know, of course matters matter, money matters tremendously. But if you have school districts that are spending, tw that have twice my per pupil, you know, they're going to cry about the cliff just as much as we are. And so at some level, the conversation has to go underneath to, you know, if you have 23,000, I, I, my per pupil is, is high for, but, but I guess average for the North average, East. Yeah. Like it's about third, 13, 13, $14,000 per pupil. So somebody else has $23,000 and, and they're going to have a problem with a cliff. I mean, that, that's where the conversation becomes about what's really going on in these schools. Incidentally, I'm not having a problem with the uh, uh, compensation evaluation change shifting my teachers uh, piece if my teachers approve my contract on the 17th. <laughs> if, if they don't, if they don't, then, then I have a problem. <laughs> and, and the, and, but it's, again, it goes back to how local and contextual this is right. yeah. uh, uh, in, in terms of the ability of districts. The governance structure matters tremendously as well. I mean, uh, you know, Bill has an elected board, God bless. Uh, uh, I, I have an appointed board, but we now know with what's happening around the mayoral run uh, districts that they're also, you know, hitting a wall around these hard decisions. So it's, 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 it's an interesting kind of moment in time because, you know, never let a crisis go to waste, right. Right? right? So, so you know, we, we are seeing, I am seeing this, we are seeing this as a, as a huge opportunity. Right. You know, mm -hmm. the mommy's, you know, the money, the money is like ending. We, we're shifting our compensation system. Uh, yeah. Not the money is ending, ending, you know, let's cry because we're going to have to lay off 500 teachers. We want to allow plenty of time for questions. Not plenty of time. We got a few minutes for Q&A. So what questions do you have? Here in the front, in the red. We've got a mic coming. Hi, my name is Tina Dubb. I'm with ASCD. One of the concerns that we have had, our members have had organizationally, is the concern for a well-rounded education. Um, given sort of where ESEA or, or NCLB sort of had us with the focus on math and reading lang language arts, the other pieces that are so important to what children need to do to be successful kind of get left by the wayside. So when you juxtapose the desire to have a well-rounded education with the realities that money is about to sort of fall off the cliff for so many folks and a lot of the well-rounded pieces are the first things cut when we start making funding cuts, how do we at your level, at the district level, maintain the kind of education that our children need to be successful in the world given that you are about to be kind of put up against the wall financially and you're going to have to make some tough choices. How do we do that? We've been, we've been put up to the wall a couple of years ago, and so we're still working through that. But even in that, even during that time frame, we, uh, we just unveiled a new secondary reform strategy. And part of why we are working with ERS is really to identify or attach a unit cost to everything we do. And so part of that really is to determine if in fact we're getting um, our money's worth, if you will, or whatever we're spending is actually adding value. But inside of that reform, it's putting language in elementary schools, it's putting language in middle schools, um, it, it's looking at um, more advanced math and more advanced sciences at much lower levels, and it is also providing as a function of the high school experience either an AP experience, an IB experience, or a, cert uh, a certification in one of the career uh, technical pathways. Uh, it, music is still extremely important for us. But here is, what, here is how we looked at that. And, and one of the reasons we wanted to get the unit cost, the first thing we did was really to go to a performance-based budget approach. 
and we performance-based our budget because every year it was just, I'm going to add 10 percent, or I'm going to add 1 percent, or 5 percent, or whatever the number was, with no real uh, tie to what the, the core um, goals or principles were for departments. It was also not based on outcomes of any sort. And one of the things we wanted to do was then drop everything to zero and then start over and talk about what things actually do have value. And so the next iteration of that is moving to more of a student base budget approach where monies actually follow the student. So that will, it will allow us to have more flexibility on how we can move shift funds from one area to another. But I say all of that to say that then our budget then is really defined by our core work as opposed to the monies that are available defining the work we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, a, that's the way we're looking at it as we, as we move forward. I, I think that there's tremendous hypocrisy in, in this conversation. Not, not from Bill, of course. I mean, um, the, the larger conversation. The everybody blames uh, NCLB for the narrowing of instruction. But NCLB is completely agnostic about what districts and schools do. You have people in schools and in districts constantly complaining about, we need to do this in order to increase our test scores, and test scores are all that matter. But the research increasingly says that you know, one of the best ways of increasing test scores is to enrich right. and to broaden. So there is, schools are getting a huge free ride in educators in terms of what's happening in schools around instruction. Uh, one of the things that we did was when we, we devolved responsibility for programming to the schools, which meant that schools needed to make the hard decisions. To me, that was about responsibility. If I'm making the hard decision, then you're not responsible for the outcomes. But there were a couple of things that we protected. We put out guidance. And for example, you, you can't cut an arts teacher or a physical education teacher in Baltimore City without my sign off. Because the reflex on the part of schools is to cut those things that are perceived to be at the margin, which I believe are you know, at the core of what parents expect to be schools and which in pieces that we think add to, you know, what learning is for kids. So schools are getting a huge free ride. They can always blame the central office or NCLB. Do we have time for one more question or do we need to move on? All right. Who wants the last question? Make it a good one. Last question. Yes. Um, based on the work that you've done, and you know your own, based on your own work leading this kind of change around how you allocate resources and working with partners like ERS, what kind of capacity needs to be built at the state level to do the same kind of um, uh, changes <laughs> in resource question. allocation? Can Can I just say that we did this completely independently of the state? Right. Yeah. Completely. I mean, we were not waiting in. I mean, we knew we needed to have guidance that was respectful of what the state was demanding as a mandate. But the conversation for us, and, and we saw the resource conversation as an essentials conversation. What do we think is essential? That was completely district driven. And the, the, the huge conversation for us was, did we have the capacity to do it fast, which we chose to do? And how were we going to engage schools and communities so that it became a citywide conversation so that we were not going to then be tripping politically at every step because it meant that some schools were going to gain and some schools were going to lose. Cindy, do you want to tackle yeah. that too? Yeah, I mean, if, unfortunately, uh, state capacity is something that has not been looked at by researchers, by politicians by advocates in, in any kind of deep way. And there's some really horrifying facts about, uh, about state education agencies. Over, on average, over 50% of their budgets are made up of federal funds. And what you have is over the last two oh. decades, state legislatures and, of course, the federal government putting more and more responsibilities on state education agencies and state legislatures cutting their budget. Yep. 
and at the same, uh, so they have less to work with. The federal responsibilities these state agencies have are a lot around compliance. And we all complain about, well, the states are too compliance oriented. Well, it's, a lot of that's accounting, distributing money, that's figuring true. out right. how the Title I formula is supposed to work within the state, doing special education, um, all sorts of stuff around that. And you can argue whether the federal government should be investing in the kind of capacity building for reform. I happen to think it is, although this isn't a very good time to be talking about more money. Um, but something has to be done. When ESEA was passed, uh, th there was something called Title V, which um, was money to state education agencies. And it helped to build up the agencies um, got them started doing things that was then wiped out, a lot of it in a bipartisan way around you got to drive dollars to the classroom. And that meant not only no capacity for the state, no capacity for districts. At the districts where there is, you can control more of the money yourself, they've been able to, to, to make wise decisions about central office capacity. And you all have taken actions to, to cut what hasn't been effective. There was nothing to cut at the state level. And so you put on top of that um, salary constraints, civil service constraints on top salaries. And you know, in this country, we've located state capitals, not in the urban areas where talented professionals tend to like to live. We locate them in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a state where it's very hard to attract talent. So there, uh, and then cities pay more. Big city school systems, these two systems, both pay more than the top salaries in the uh, state of Maryland. I'm virtually positive. And uh, this is true across the country. So we wonder why we have these capacity issues. We can't attract talent. We can't, we, th they have no, um, they have no, very little money to work on what we, say, designing effective evaluation systems. Federal government's helped with designing state assessments, a new generation of assessments. There's um, turning around low performing schools. Most of that money has to be driven right to the district, to the district and school. Yeah. And the states are going to be held responsible for taking action and helping these schools. They don't have anything to work with. And that it's not that people have been had ill will towards states it's just it's it's neglect neglect to understanding the state role in this country neglect at looking at the governance system we have in this country which is the most decentralized of any advanced country it's just gross inattention um, mm -hmm. now my buddy Rick Hess and I are getting ready to do a little work on this issue um, so stay tuned all right, on that uplifting note, I think we will have to call it a day on this panel. Thank you very much. Wish we had more time, but we appreciate it. I think it's always a good sign when a panel like that leaves you wanting more. Okay, so everyone, we're going to get started right into our keynote address now, if folks want to keep, keep their seats. I know you're all anxious to hear from our next speaker, uh, who as the saying goes, n needs no introduction. Uh, so I'll keep the preliminaries brief for a change. Um, so we were thrilled and honored when Melody Barnes accepted our invitation to deliver today's keynote address. Uh, as you will all know, Melody is President Barack Obama's domestic policy advisor and the director of the Domestic Policy Council at the White House. Uh, the council coordinates the administration's policy-making process on domestic issues. It's the nerve center uh, for domestic-based policy. So if there's anyone who has a deep understanding of the dynamic p policy environment of the past two years, as well as insight on where the administration is setting its sights now, in general, and for education, it's Melody. Before serving in the White House, Melody was a senior domestic policy advisor to President Obama's campaign, and prior to that had a distinguished career in both the private sector as an executive vice president for policy at the Center for American Progress and in government. She served as chief counsel to Senator, Ed Senator Edward Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee and held posts with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission 
and the House Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights. Throughout her career, Melody has been known as a tireless champion of civil rights, voting rights, women's health, and religious liberties, and she is a great supporter and friend of America's schools, educators, and children. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Melody Barnes. Well, thank you so much. And Chris, thank you for that introduction. And it's so wonderful to be here with you all this afternoon. You all are the hearty, the dedicated, um, who care so much about education and here on a Friday afternoon. So I know I stand between you and I guess one last speaker and a chance to mix and mingle. Um, so I appreciate that. I want to, well, one, it's also great to be here with my former colleague, Cindy Brown, and my CAP colleagues, but also with our friends at AEI, and also want to thank Education Weekly for convening today's event and talking about this very, very important issue. You know, our, our nation has always valued education. We built public elementary and high schools to provide a free education to our children. We built institutions of higher education, four-year and two-year, because we recognize that a democracy requires a well-educated citizenry. As President Obama has said before, in fact, he said it over and over again, but I think it does bear repeating, there is no so stronger weapon against, no better path to opportunity than an education that can unlock a child's God-given potential. Few civil rights are as critical to the cause of human freedom as equal educational opportunity. Education is and should continue to be an issue that rises above politics and ideology, one that engenders collaboration and hard work in the interest of our nation's students. I'm sure that's why all of us in this room do the work that we do. And from Senator Kennedy's historic collaboration with President Bush and with, Senate and with uh, Congressman John Boehner to our administration's ambitious reform agenda that is rooted in race to the top, we've seen that education is an area where Republicans and Democrats can work together. Last year, the President set a goal that by the year 2020, the end of this decade, we will once again lead the world in having the highest share of college graduates. We know that this is an ambitious goal, and it can only be realized by embarking on comprehensive reform of our education system from cradle through college. We need to raise expectations for absolutely everyone that touches the education pipeline. That includes students and teachers, parents and policymakers. Two imperatives drive us toward this goal. The first is a moral imperative. For millions of American families, and I would say that this is my personal experience as well, whether Indian or immigrant, whether descendants of those on the Mayflower or descendants of slaves, education has always been the great equalizer and the engine for the American dream. Our ability to deliver a complete and competitive education for every child is ultimately a test of our most fundamental principles of fairness, equality, and opportunity. And second, there's an economic imperative. We must move forward because we know that education is critical to the economic well-being of every individual. And it is imperative, it is critical to America's future success and standing in the global economy. Economic progress and educational advancement go hand in hand. Public high schools transformed the economy of our industrializing nation, and investments in math and science propelled a new era of invention and discovery. Land-grant colleges opened a host of new opportunities, and the GI Bill generated a middle class that made America's economy unrivaled in the 20th century. And in fact, if you talk to my dad, and he and I were having this conversation fairly recently, you know, he and my mom got married, and he was coming out of the Army in 1960. And I remember my father's graduation because he both worked and went to college at the same time. He graduated from college when I was a little girl. And when you ask him about his educational opportunity, the opportunity that we had as a family, he says, thank God for the GI Bill. So all of these educational advancements help propel our country over generations and over the centuries. 
But as the President has said, the country that out-educates us today out-competes us tomorrow. And unfortunately, today, the United States ranks 21st and 25th in the world in quality of mathematics and science education. And as compared to our global competitors, we rank ninth in terms of college completion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the United States. We don't play for second. We certainly don't play for 21st, 25th, and 9th. And yet, the truth is that nations in Asia and across Europe have outpaced us. They've set high standards and changed the way they prepare and retain their teachers and principals and improve the means by which they measure and support student learning. We can do the same and much, much more to reach our goals, but we have to advance reform and focus on improving opportunities and outcomes for every student at every stage in the educational pipeline. Investing in early education, taking important steps to reform our K-12 system, and bringing a laser-like focus on the challenges that face us when we think about college affordability, access, and attainment. Our very youngest children must have a solid foundation on which to build a healthy and stable and secure future. For every dollar we invest in children before they enter school, we know that we get $10 back in terms of our savings based on the welfare rolls, our health care costs, and the cost that we are the savings because of less crime. If we were able to get that kind of return on our portfolios, our investment portfolios, we would be absolutely giddy. So why aren't we making those kinds of investments in early childhood? We know that kids that are enrolled in successful early childhood education programs are more likely to score higher in math and reading, more likely to graduate from high school, attend college, and more likely to hold a job and hold a job that gives them a higher income. For those reasons, our administration has launched a comprehensive zero to five education plan, a plan to expand early education at early childhood education and to continue improving its quality. First, our administration is investing in bolstering the existing framework of federal programs and services to reach our youngest children. So that's Head Start, our child care programs, and other essential learning programs. Second, our administration is committing to expand regular home visits to needy parents to better ensure that children are healthy and prepared for life. That's actually a reform that we were able to include in the Affordable Care Act. And with bipartisan support for that initiative, we plan to scale up evidence-based home visiting services that improve child health and development, school readiness, parenting skills, and prevention of child maltreatment. But a big challenge facing early learning continues to be the uneven quality of our programs. As President Obama has pointed out, some programs are excellent, some are mediocre, and some fail to capitalize on the developmental potential of our children in their most formative years. For those reasons, our administration has been dedicated to improving outcomes for children beginning in those years. We've begun with steps to promote accountability in our Head Start programs. In Head Start, our investment is coupled with reform. We're improving training and standards and creating mentorships to improve the skills of our Head Start professionals. We're building effective partnerships with schools that will only drive federal funds to those programs that are actually producing results. We've also called for what we are now naming an Early Learning Challenge Fund. That fund will challenge states to do the same kinds of things that we are doing on the federal level by raising the bar of quality of their early care and early education programs. We must call on those states that have already demonstrated some commitment to delivering high quality early learning programs to expand their systems into models of reform and excellence for our youngest children. In K through 12 education, we're re approaching our work with great urgency and jump-starting reforms that are focused on preparing our children for college and careers by the year 2020. As you know, we've launched Race to the Top to challenge states to embark upon systematic reform and to adopt innovative approaches to improving America's schools. With just over $4 billion that we 
were able to ascertain in the Recovery Act, we've been able to support 12 states in the District of Columbia that are moving the furthest and the fastest towards reform. And while every state didn't win new educational resources, the children in many of the states that applied are still reaping the rewards of the competition. 32 of the 46 states that submitted RTT applications have made significant changes in laws or policies to promote education reforms that are consistent with the principles that are reflected in Race to the Top. Accounting for this extraordinary interest in the states, the President has proposed to continue Race to the Top in his 2011 budget by requesting another $1.35 billion to continue the momentum and expand the competition to school districts. So not just states, but school districts. Our RTT reforms are based on four key principles. First, we're working to help support states as they raise their standards so that they're rigorous and relevant and to usher in a new generation of assessments. And I know our previous panel was just talking about that. Those, kind, those assessments that we believe will drive an accountability system that's focused on keeping every student on track to success. Standards are the building blocks of reform and to date, we have had a race to the bottom. We know that in the years between 2005 and 2007, 15 states actually lowered their standards in reading and math, and 31 have been setting the bar lower than even the basic levels on our national NAEP benchmark, the National Assess Assessment of Educational Progress. That is no way to keep competition moving forward. And in fact, what we're doing is we are setting our children up to fail. Instead, we need to deliver a comprehensive and well-rounded curriculum in every one of our schools and focus on the goal of preparing our children for college. Our nation's employers need a workforce that's full of problem solvers and analytic thinkers and great communicators and good writers. When you're talking to the people at the top of the game in human resource management, those are the skill sets that they tell you that they're looking for. They're looking for people who bring creativity and ingenuity and problem-solving skills to the job. Our entire education system, from standards and assessments to how we train teachers, every element must promote this level of readiness, along with strong skills in math and science and reading. Second, we need to ensure that every child has a highly effective teacher because great teachers make all the difference in helping our students succeed. We've embarked upon a new national effort to build the teaching profession, to improve how we prepare and support teachers, and to develop new systems that will better identify and reward the most talented teachers while helping those who are less effective succeed. And I, I feel like I've had kind of a bird's eye view on some of this outside of the professional realm. I mean, my mother was a teacher for many, many years, went on to become an administrator in the public school system in Richmond, Virginia, and I watched over the arc of her career as, uh, even after she retired, when she became what we, what we in uh, the education community call a master teacher. I mean, working with those younger teachers, helping them, giving them individualized attention and support, and we believe that that's necessary if we're really going to retain teachers Help the young, help younger teachers, but also make the the careers of our wiser, older teachers more fulfilling and more rewarding. Our administration's approach is to expect the most of our teachers and principals, particularly in helping their students make progress academically. In return, we will support them and give them a chance to fulfill new opportunities and assume new roles in their careers. Third, we need to confront the conditions of America's lowest performing schools and challenge the notion that it is acceptable for some schools to fail and to steal the promise from our children who are desperately looking for a way to succeed. To the 2,000 high schools that are responsible for more than half of America's dropouts, let me be clear, failure is no longer an option. It is no longer acceptable. Whether these schools are in urban or rural settings, regardless of the background or color or ethnicity of their students, our goal is academic excellence. We're dedicating $4 billion to turn around and transform our lowest performing schools and provide a better chance for our students. 
The challenges of a new century demand new approaches to teaching and learning in our schools. So we're incorporating more time for learning and enrichment, whether during the summer, after school, or through a longer school day or year. And other nations spend an additional month in school over our students. We know that our children need more time. They deserve more time on task. And we're also focused on better engaging parents and communities in their children's educational success. We know that this work is difficult. We know that there are a lot of people who have been focused and attentive to these issues for many, many years, and there is no silver bullet. But our administration is encouraged that just since we've come into office, there has been a tremendous wave of reform, and reform that's been picking up all over the country. So many people from superintendents to school board members to parents, business and community leaders. When I talk to business leaders, it's interesting. I mean, we're CEOs of Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies, and they'll say to me, yeah, I was just with my peer X at another Fortune 50 company, and we spent about 20 minutes talking about business, and we spent about two hours talking about education. We know that people across the spectrum are so excited about this work and dedicating themselves to changing what doesn't work in our system and doing what's best for our young people. Race to the top is only one element of these efforts. In March, our administration also released a blueprint to fix the No Child Left Behind Act by re-envisioning ESEA to help scale and support the kinds of reforms I was just talking about across all 50 states. Reauthorizing ESEA gives us the opportunity to build on the reform momentum and it's also our commitment to helping all, ensure that all students are college and career ready. In many ways, our ESEA blueprint represents the next generation of standards-based reform for the next generation of students, building on all the work done in the states and at the federal level over the last three decades. But our plans for ESEA also embody and advance many of the principles of equity and opportunity that were there when the framing of the act took place in the war, during the war on poverty in 1965. Many of these reforms are de have Democratic and Republican support over the years. And, that, and for that, we know that there is a great deal of common ground in fixing the accountability system, advancing a new framework for the federal role in education that's results-oriented. That means rewarding excellence through more competitions across the states. It also means reforming and consolidating our existing investment in education from 38 disparate programs to 11 funding streams that will function more effectively for states and school districts. It also means preparing, developing, and rewarding effective teachers in the way that I just mentioned, and bringing new energy and bold strategies to turn around our lowest performing schools. It also means promoting successful conditions for innovation and effective charter schools. I mean, one of the things that Secretary Duncan often talks about is we have to set and work with the states to set the right goals and the right standards, but we also have to allow for innovation and enough flexibility for innovation that can take place at the district level. It also means providing a more well-rounded well education by funding the development and scale-up of effective programs in additional subjects, foreign languages, history, civics, geography, the arts, the economic and financial literacy. And it also means supporting safe, successful, and healthy development out of students inside and outside of school. Our teams at the White House and the Department of Education have worked very closely with Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate over the course of the last year to lay the, found the framework and to lay the foundation for reauthorization of ESEA. This is a top priority for the President. It is a top priority for President Obama. And the President will make a a commitment to reauthorization and a promise to engage with the House and the Senate for reauthorization of ESEA at the beginning of the new year. We also have to recommit ourselves to ensure that every student who dreams of college can attend. Just over a quarter century ago, a worker with high school credentials could make at least half of what his or her peer who didn't have, who had a college degree um, would make. But today's economy rewards those with a higher education. College graduates earn an average 77% more per hour 
than a, than a high school graduate. And in the coming years, the number of jobs that require an associate's degree is projected to grow twice as fast as those jobs that require no college experience. Even though we know the benefit of a post-secondary degree or certificate, Today, only about 40% of Americans have completed college. That goes to the 2020 goal that I mentioned at the beginning of remarks. We've got to get from that 40% level to about 60%. That means that we have to find ways to ensure that children who live in low-income areas and children, whether they're African American or Latino or Indian or Asian, have equal access to the resources that make higher education possible. And that's why when we passed the Affordable Care Act last spring, at the same time, we passed the biggest reform to higher education since the GI Bill. So we turned around our antiquated student lending program uh, and made it a program that now works better for students and their families as opposed to subsidizing the banks. And in doing that, we were able to take that savings to put it into support for community college, which we know is a resource that the federal government hasn't supported, and the reforms that need to take place um, haven't been supported. And in doing that, we are encouraging better alignment with the private sector and bringing community colleges together with the business community to make sure that those certificates that are earned are actually worth something, that when a student finishes a degree program or gets a certification, it's for a job that will actually exist, a job of the future. We've also, we also put those savings into our Pell Grant system so that students are now able to get a Pell Grant award that actually keeps pace with inflation, that allows, that covers the cost or the majority of the cost of a higher education degree. And we're helping to lift some of that uh, loan uh, repayment burden that really rests very, very heavily on too many kids and, and on too many families. Taken together, these investments propel us towards a college completion goal that will bring individuals and families greater security and ensure that our country is able to compete on the global stage. So we know that education is no longer just a pathway to opportunity and success. We know that it's a prerequisite. But for too long, we fail to face the challenges in our schools, and we fail to make the hard choices and investments necessary to ensure that all of our children are prepared to succeed. For those reasons, the evidence is clear that this is the moment to move forward with reform. The, there are nascent and maturing efforts around the country, and I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with them. And we also know that families are demanding us to ask. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a grocery store or in a clothing boutique trying on a dress, and someone has come up to me and said, don't you work on domestic policy and education? And they have gone off on why we need to revisit No Child Left Behind and why we need reforms in our education system, which, you know, when you're standing in a three-way mirror, kind of halfway clothed, is an interesting conversation. Um, but it just shows you the passion that exists around these issues. Partisan tussling and dead-end ideological debates are not going to be tolerated by the public, and they shouldn't be. The American people are looking for smart solutions, and the president is prepared to work with parents and teachers and governors and the private sector and Congress to get this done, to make sure that the American education system is once again the envy of the world and to ensure that our children are prepared for bright futures and our country is able to compete on the world stage. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing, for your engagement and support around these issues. And we look forward to working with all of you as we not only continue this conversation in the months to come, but also continue this work to get it over the goal line. Again, our goal is to set a table for education and for children, to bring everyone who cares about those issues around that table, and to make sure that we accomplish the kinds of reforms that are necessary to help our children be successful. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me here today. And good luck with your work as well. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, Melody has other commitments and she has to leave right away. Um, I'm sure we'd all have plenty of questions. Na naturally, the thing that I'm going to pull out of Melody's great remarks um, was the changing room conversation. 
Um, because I think it speaks to the issue that there are a lot of people out there, not everybody out there has a connection to education. Virtually everybody you meet um, has been to school and they, th they know a certain aspect of what it means to run an education system, they think. Um, but I think one of the big challenges is to try to engage that interest and that connection around a real agenda for change. And I think one of the things that really came out in Melody's remarks was the administration's commitment to um, continuing on with what has been a very ambitious um, agenda and you know, putting it at the top of the list, hopefully, for the coming year. So perhaps ESA, ESEA reauthorization you know, is in the cards. We'll see. Um, so in wrapping up today's program, I'm going to turn over the podium one last time to uh, Virginia B. Edwards, also known as Ginny. Uh, Ginny is the president of Editorial Projects in Education and the editor-in-chief of Education Week and edweek.org. Ginny. Actually, I told the AV guy I was going to use a microphone and kind of walk around, but I, I, this will be easier for me to stay here. Um, I didn't, I don't have prepared remarks. I was just going to do some dot connecting. That's kind of what I do in my business and what I like to think I can uh, add to this. First of all, I'd like to thank folks for coming today. You guys are terrific for staying today. It's been noted. It's Friday afternoon. It's beautiful outside. Uh, I'd especially like to thank my EPE colleagues who are here, uh, who worked so hard to put this event on, Chris Swanson as our uh, really master in ceremonies, in fact, today, but behind the scenes, played that role for several months, actually. Uh, thank you to Hewlett for your support and for being here today. Thanks. Thanks to Pew for making this space available. Our panelists were terrific. I really appreciate that they were able to join us today. And finally, what you don't know is several hundred people have joined us uh, virtually. Um, uh, at least, uh, nearly 200 people have stayed with us all day online. So that's really quite amazing, and I love that. So the first thing I want to say is that I love when the headline matches the story. So look at our headline for this event today, Reform, Money, and Politics, the Outlook for American Education. And I think we delivered on that, and I'm really particularly pleased that our um, panelists ranging from the political consultants to the folks looking at this from generally the 30,000 foot level to the folks in the districts and doing the, uh, the work on the ground really stuck to the topic at hand as well as Melody of course when um, it, with her remarks as we uh, wrapped up. So there are just, again, a few points I want to make. Uh, and unlike Chris, I can't be funny with my, uh, you know, fire on the roof and Clorox and the uh, uh, research. But he here are my takeaways. No doubt about it, there is an important inflection point with education right now. Uh, I keep calling it an important moment in time. Everybody in this room knows that. And there are several reasons why that's the case. Um, and I thought it was interesting that our folks pointed to, whether it be in Michelle McNeil's panel with the district folks, talking about some of the great reform that was already happening pre even the economic stimulus and federal money flowing. But here's the deal. Just in the past year or so, we have common core standards. Just in the past year or so, we have a new conversation around next generation assessments. Just in the past, well, I would say for longer than a year now, but in a very continuing to be constructive way, we have a more robust conversation around the human capital pipeline and the role of t teaching effectiveness, teacher effectiveness. We've had a very good conversation over the past several years around what it means to be college and career ready. And finally, I would add to this list, not to pander to my uh, colleagues at Hewlett, but this, this evolution in the conversation around what it means to engage in deeper learning and what it means to think about the construct of schooling in a different kind of way that breaks down time barriers and space barriers to think about what really, and here's the big takeaway for me, let's talk about the ends and not the means, right? So 
that's, that's one point. The second point related to the money is there are several, almost sometimes at odds, forces at work. We've had an inflow of money in the form of stimulus, in the form of race to the top, I3, I3 funding, and other federal funding. At the same time, there's a wicked lack of funding going on uh, in terms, as most epitomized by capacity issues at the district level and at the state level. We've, we're in the midst still, uh, well, even though the recession's been declared over. There are definite economic problems with this 9.6 percent inflation uh, that, um, uh, sorry, 9.6 percent unemployment, deflationary times almost, sorry, um, that we're living with today. And uh, the specter of government shutdown was even added to the conversation, which is an interesting political dynamic to think about. Finally, um, there, much of today's conversation, rightly, was about um, the reauthorization of ESEA. You notice, of course, I said ESEA because we also, uh, I think, agree in this room that the brand of NCLB is a non-starter. And that just changed, not that what was NCLB at one time was, was wrong, but for this conversation to move on, we've got to get out of the construct of NCLB, I think was pretty universally agreed to. And we have to figure out a way to give it, I'm going to use a researchy term, face validity with the public, with educators, and with policymakers to be able to move on. Um, so, in conclusion, which I will get us out before our deadline. Um, I would say some of the conversation around what's the narrative of how we want to get from here to there was particularly impactful for me. Again, that's another way of saying we want to talk about the means, or I'm sorry, we want to talk about the ends instead of the means. I think that's absolutely right on. Um, there, Oh, I had something very specific about the narrative of how we, oh, just that th w this will take engaging people in this conversation. And you won't be surprised to hear me say that I think really good information, really good opportunities for conversation, really good data, really good resources, really good stuff that gets stirred into the pot to be able to inform that conversation is really important to be able to have a fruitful conversation to move that narrative forward. So again, thank you, thank you all very much for coming today. I appreciate you sticking it out with us. And as Chris said, actually I made a big star by my little Quality Counts note here. Quality Counts this year is about reform money and politics. And we didn't really even plan that. But uh, I mean, we planned it to the extent we picked it as our topic going back nine months ago. But it is, you know, the confluence of these topics is really obviously incredibly uh, timely and important. So maybe we'll see you back in this room on January 11th. Thank you very much.